With an incredible survivor story came an intense amount of survivor's guilt, especially when the exact reason she was fighting was why everyone called her a liar. No amount of apologies could make up for gaslighting a 15-year-old who had escaped an abduction and for ignoring her pleas to find her best friend. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about the 15-year-old who survived abduction and her best friend who is still missing. If you don't know, it's my absolute passion to tell these stories. I mean, no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that's something that you would like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on, giving this video a thumbs up, and leaving a comment down below. You can also follow me on Instagram at Brooke McKenna for short little true crime videos. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1997 in Australia and Vanessa Conlon lived in Bathurst, which was about three hours from Sydney. Now she was known to be a very happy, adventurous teenager and she had a best friend named Jessica Small. They were both 15 years old. And now Jessica loved everyone and everything, especially children and animals. And she didn't actually come from a wealthy family or a known family and neither did Vanessa. But Jessica lived very simply with her mother, Ricky, and her older siblings, Rebecca and Matthew. Matthew. Now, Jessica was known to be the more outspoken, tenacious kind of girl, and both Vanessa and Jessica were known to be more wild teens who were always out trying to find something to do together that was extremely fun, out of their comfort zone, and also with their friends. Jessica was often staying at Vanessa's home, even overnight, and the two girls' families actually lived pretty close together, which is how they met. Now, at 15, they had both been in year 10 at Kelsco High School. However, Jessica did recently drop out about mid-year because the Australian school system does go the end of January through mid-December. So it was, you know, during our summer here in America, during June, July, that Jessica decided to drop out. Now the girls remained friends and they would see each other pretty much every night once Vanessa got home from school. They would be talking about gossip and boys, they would watch TV, they would listen to music. And Vanessa's home was this constant in Jessica's life that she needed because her home life was becoming harder to manage. Jessica would often tell Vanessa that her mother Ricky was out drinking quite a lot and she would go out to these local hotels and spend all of their money, including the money that was needed for groceries. So often there wouldn't even be any food in the home because of this. And while Vanessa was in school, Jessica did not decide to return and she would go from many different friends and family members' homes throughout this time to have a place to stay. And sometimes she would stay with her mother if there was food in the house and they weren't fighting. But on Sunday, October 25th, Jessica and Vanessa decided to visit a local arcade that had a whole bunch of video games and pool tables inside. It was made mostly for the teens of the area and it was called Amuse Me. This was on Russell Street, which was a busy area in town, and they would leave around midnight planning either to walk home or to get a ride from somebody and only one would actually make it back. A local resident of this area on Hereford Street named Faye Connors would be awoken shortly after midnight to screams and banging on her front door. Now at first she was a bit worried to answer and open the door to this person who was making such a ruckus, but she decided to because this young girl sounded like she was in desperate need of help. And so she opened the door and she saw a very young, panicked, and completely white as a ghost little girl. She was begging to come inside. Faye allowed her to, but she had no idea she was saving an abduction victim. Now, her home was only actually three minutes from the arcade that the girls had just been at, and immediately the police were called, and they came, you know, later in that morning, since it was already past midnight, they came later that day, and Vanessa Conlon began to tell her story, and Sergeant Peter McFarland and Constable Rooney witnessed Vanessa crying, trembling, and terrified, and it took her actually six minutes 
minutes to calm down enough for them to understand what she was saying. And the sergeant said that he hadn't seen someone that upset in a long time. Still scared, Vanessa did speak up and tell her story. And she said that earlier, the night prior, that her and Jessica had gone to 21 Fish Parade to get some food. And then they walked into town to meet Jessica's mother at one of the hotels to get some money for Jessica. And they then walked to the Amuse Me video game arcade. They ate some food. They hung out with friends. They played games. And they were really having a good time. Vanessa said that Jessica had a few drinks, but she was only a bit tipsy. And everyone was playing pool and dancing to music. They went with a group of friends to King's Parade Park and then Jessica decided to go with one of those friends to go see if another one of their friends was at home. His name was Ben Clark. He lived in Bathurst and they had gone and then immediately came back because he was not yet home. Jessica and Vanessa then kind of separated from the friend group. They went to go to Mix Takeaway for food and then head back to Amuse Me. However, once they got there, they realized that it was actually closed and nobody was even lingering. Everybody had gone home. So they walked to William Street and they were trying to decide whether they should just go home and go to bed or if they should try to go back to their friend Ben's house to see if he was home yet because he was often the one that would throw parties and have people come and hang out at his place. And before they could actually decide, they saw a car drive past them very slowly, then do a U-turn and come back right next to them. These best friends thought that this was the perfect opportunity to ask for a ride because Ben's home was a significant distance away that they didn't necessarily want to walk when they could get a ride and they were known to hitchhike like many other people were during this time period. So Vanessa was actually the one to go up to this door and talk to the driver as Jessica sat in the park and watched. Now they kind of would alternate who would ask these drivers if they could have a ride and it was Vanessa's turn and you know this driver actually asked her if they had had fun playing pool and video games and you know at that point Vanessa really didn't think much of this that he knew exactly where they were that night. Now, Vanessa said that this was a four-door white sedan, but that's really all that she knew about vehicles, and this man did offer to drive them there. So, Vanessa got in the front, Jessica got in the back, and they were still on William Street, so they just needed to go to Hereford Street, which is where Ben's home was. Now, as they got closer, Vanessa started pointing down the street on Hereford Street to a home with the lights on that was supposedly Ben's home, and was saying, you know, you can just drop us off there, that'd be great but she noticed at this point the driver started slowing down and this was far before they got down to Ben's home so she began to get worried she was looking in the mirror outside of the car trying to look back at Jessica to let her know that something was wrong but that is when the car stopped they were parked next to a wire fence when this man took off his seatbelt and began reaching back to Jessica saying that he wanted her to come here and Vanessa told him, I don't think so. At this point, Vanessa was pushed back into her seat and held by her throat and Jessica in the back was trying to escape at this point, opening her door. So this driver reached back to her and at that same time, Vanessa was trying to get out of her her door. But when the man decided he couldn't reach Jessica, he went back for Vanessa and started pulling on her hair to get her back into the car. In order to get away, Vanessa had to rip her hair out of his hand and both of the girls began running down the street. Now they both began screaming and running down the road, but Vanessa also knew that this man was following close behind, but she thought that they would get away. She could hear Jessica screaming right next to her. And then as she was running, she couldn't really look back because she knew that she needed to keep going forward. And so she heard Jessica scream this very long drawn out help. And then she heard nothing but her adrenaline kept her running to the first home that she could with a light on outside, and that would lead her to fake Connors. She then realized the devastating truth that Jessica hadn't gotten away. This man, this car, and Jessica were gone. 
Now, Vanessa did describe this man from what she could remember from her very traumatic experience. And she said that he was white from 20 to 30, medium build, wore a dark pullover with short, possibly even wavy hair. Now, investigators would talk to Faye as well to see exactly how she felt about the story and about Vanessa that night. And she said that Vanessa was so obviously shaken up when she opened that door that she knew something very bad had happened. Now, the sergeant and the constable decided to take Vanessa around at this time to try to locate the vehicle that she was talking about, the white four-door sedan, because she didn't know what kind of vehicle it was. Now, she did remember, though, that it had holes in the floorboard of the passenger seat that she could see through the car to the road. It was believed these could have been bullet holes. And there was also an orange blanket covering the back shelf right above the rear seats. Now, throughout the search, they were unable to find this sort of vehicle, especially not the exact one, but through more questioning, they were able to kind of understand what Vanessa had seen that night. And she was trying to describe a Holden Commodore. It wasn't long before a call came in and a witness was saying that in Bathurst in the early morning hours that day, they had almost seen a car crash. Now it started with a white Commodore barreling around the corner at high speed with the headlights off. Now, this would not be the only report of a Commodore car in town, and two days later, the most crucial tip would come in. Now, a man named Robert Fitzpatrick said that that early morning, he was awake at about 1 a.m., and he lived in Eglinton, which was not too far away from Bathurst, but he heard a woman screaming from a car that was a white Commodore and saw a hand reaching out from the back seat of the car. So obviously this woman was sitting or laying in the back. But at this point, he was watching outside of his window and the car stopped. The driver got out, went around to the trunk, got something, went back in, was kneeling on his seat, the driver's seat, doing something in the back. And at this point, there was a little bang and then the screaming stopped. This was believed to be the last sighting of the car. Now, not only did three people corroborate Vanessa's story, it was seeming more and more likely that Jessica had been abducted. Now, that seems very obvious to you, but you'll realize in a moment why that wasn't something that everybody believed. Now, it was quite hard to piece together exactly where Jessica had been staying, who she'd been hanging out with ever since she dropped out of school. They didn't really know she would move from place to place, just kind of staying wherever she could. But all that was known was that 11 days before the abduction, she and Vanessa had gone to Sydney to do some shopping. However, after this, Vanessa did not see Jessica for a while because she actually had gone to Orange to spend some time with one of her friends named Ricky Vincent. There she would actually be staying at the home of Belinda and Brendan Forsman, but she ended up being kicked out because she was inviting young males there to hang out with her. Now, Vanessa and Jessica didn't really have any contact with each other during this time, but three days before the abduction, Jessica did come back into town and they would meet up once again. And Vanessa had noticed that Jessica had cut her hair really short. She was no longer wearing makeup like she always did. And she almost didn't even recognize her. And it also turned out that when Jessica arrived back in Bathurst, she had gone to the owner of this video arcade, Amuse Me, Mal Pollard, and asked him to basically keep a bag of clothes for her because she didn't know where else to put it while she was in between houses. And she was close with this owner. A lot of people at Amuse Me did know these girls. Now, the night before the abduction, Jessica had stayed at a man named Chris Hogan's home in O'Connell. And the next day, his father gave her a ride back to Bathurst and she was believed to go to her mother's house and, you know, just stay there for a little bit. It was unknown if her mother was actually there, but then she was later going to be hanging out with Vanessa. Vanessa had told investigators everything she could possibly think of about that night, the days prior, exactly where Jessica could be. She told them everything. Jessica's mother, Ricky, did a TV interview and said, bring her back home. Jess, if you were out there, please call me or let the police know you are all right. She said that she tried to warn Jessica about hitchhiking after two schoolgirls had vanished due to hitchhiking three weeks prior in Bega. 
which was six hours away. Now, some did believe that these two cases could be connected because the Bega girls were 16-year-old Nicole Collins and 15-year-old Lauren Barry, who were both around the same age as Vanessa and Jessica. Now, the Bega girls were going to friends' houses, walking down the street when witnesses came forward saying that they heard screaming. Now, the owner of Amuse Me, Mal Pollard, had said that Jessica was this really sweet kid and he couldn't believe that this would happen in such a small town. At first, there were 11 detectives on the case. They were searching banks and bushes and anywhere that she could possibly be, dead or alive. They appeared to be trying. The problem was, these investigators, the entire police department, were said to know Vanessa and Jessica. They believed them to be these troubled teens, but I could not find a criminal record on either of them where they were arrested or where they had been convicted of anything. The officers, however, didn't seem to care, and Vanessa's entire story was deemed a false statement. Investigators in Bathurst, Australia had their own theory. They believed that Jessica had simply run away to escape her mother and that Vanessa made this whole scene so it would seem as though she was really missing. Due to this, nothing was done and a 15-year-old survivor told her story hoping to save her best friend when instead she was called a liar. Zero witnesses were questioned, possible suspects were not looked into, and none of the car records for Holden Commodores in the area were even looked into. No officer was put in charge of this investigation, and no witnesses were located who had been at this Amuse Me place that night and could possibly tell them more about anyone suspicious they had seen around these girls. A 15-year-old girl was missing, and this wasn't just for a few hours or a few days. Jessica Small would remain missing for the next 10 years. The case went cold with nothing but Vanessa's statement in that file. Jessica's mother, Ricky, had never been updated, nor did she know what happened to her daughter. 10 years later, in 2007, a strike force was finally formed for the entire police department due to what was believed to be their negligence. Now, Detective Sergeant Peter Smith from the Homicide Squad felt very passionate about reopening this case, and he would tell 60 Minutes that it didn't make sense that a girl would run screaming and terrified to a random person's house in the middle of the night to just have nobody believe her. Especially due to the fact that even after so many years, so many people who had questioned her, Vanessa's story had never changed, not even one tiny detail. Now, he actually went to Vanessa and he told her that he believed her. And this was the first time that she had been told that by an investigator. Now, Vanessa had given a description of her abductor. However, after so many years, it was unknown if Vanessa would really be able to help identify this man. But there was someone else who also saw this man. And Detective Smith was going to question him. Now, all those years ago, investigators had ignored yet another witness. This was an employee of Amuse Me who was working that night, and he had gone to police the day after Jessica had vanished, saying that a man had come in that night and started talking to him about Jessica. No one ever came to take a statement from him, and Detective Smith realized this and immediately contacted him. This was William Ross, and he knew both Vanessa and Jessica and said that Jessica was drinking a little bit that night, but then he saw a grown man walk in that he had never seen before, and he came up to him, and he began saying that he worked at the Oberon Timber Hill. This William said that this man looked about 34 years old, and he was also watching Jessica, who was dancing at this time, and asked who she was. He also said she looked like she was out for a good time. Now, William did tell him that it was Jess, and William said that this man was about 5'8", medium build, with a bit of a beer belly, dark hair, and was thought to be Australian. He was wearing jeans, joggers, a long-sleeved button shirt, and either a cowboy-type shirt or a flannelette shirt, and a set of keys hanging from his jeans. There was also a friend of the girls who had seen this suspicious man as well, and he made a statement too all the way back in 1997 and was just now being questioned. This was Darren Mason who said that he had seen this man staring at Jessica all night who was this big build, dark brown, straggly shoulder length hair wearing a red and black flannelette shirt and jacket. Darren said that he looked out of place and was always standing 
out of sight of security cameras. Another friend of the girls named Sarah Thornhill said she saw a man at Amuse Me that night who had been driving a white Commodore. All these witnesses were more than willing to talk. They had wished they could have earlier and they tried to remember as much as they could and it was going to be hard because it had been a decade, but they were willing to do whatever they could for Jessica. Now this investigation would require an entire team because they were preparing to question over 400 men as suspects. Now every one of these men were men who had worked at the Oberon timber mill when Jessica had vanished due to this man looking at Jessica, saying that he worked there. Now, they were looking into hundreds, but just two stood out to them. Meanwhile, 17 years after her abduction in 2014, the inquest into Jessica's disappearance was held for three weeks and 50 witnesses were there. Now, they were there to discuss if Jessica had run away, died of an overdose, taken her own life, or had been abducted and murdered. Now, the theory for running away was that Jessica did have a bad relationship with her mom, and she also had a family friend pass the same day that she vanished. But the thing was, she never spoke about running away and had many different places that she would go if she wanted to get away from her mother. She didn't seem like someone who needed to get completely out of town. There were said to be some sightings of Jessica in towns nearby after she had allegedly vanished, but none could be confirmed, and her family has not heard from her since. Now, as far as the drugs, everyone knew that Jessica did use marijuana and alcohol, and it was said she tried a few other drugs a few other times, and her sister was involved in drug use, but she was not known to go fully into a drug addiction, and she was not said to be on drugs that night that she vanished, only drinking a little bit. She was also never known to be suicidal. Now, the two detectives that had originally questioned Jessica, Sergeant McFarland and Constable Rooney, they did admit that the entire time they questioned Vanessa, they were pushing her. They were trying to confuse her, get her to change her story, to see if she was lying or not because they really knew that the rest of the police department wouldn't believe her. Now, it was said that these two did actually believe her and did listen to Vanessa and they admitted that she was consistent with every single detail in her story. Nothing ever changed but they knew that the rest of the police department would not believe her. Due to this, it was said that they refused to investigate anyone or anything. And if they would have done their jobs, they would have found out that Robert Fitzpatrick, who saw the car stop in front of his road that day, had an immense amount of guilt and was more than willing to talk about exactly what he saw. He now believes that he could have saved Jessica that day if he would have just run out the door. However, he thought it was some sort of domestic violence situation. And back then they didn't get involved with that kind of stuff. And he was just keeping to himself. After he called, the police did nothing. So he decided to go to the police department to give them a statement and he did, but he said that they seemed very disinterested in what he was saying and only wrote down a little note and had him go and never contacted him again. But the whole time I got the feeling like he didn't want to take the statement. Like, uh, he's already made up his mind what was going on. He also said that he had a description of the driver that was never taken. He saw a big man between 30 to 40 years old, and not only that, but he also had the license plate number at one point that was memorized. He didn't write it down because he didn't have a pen at that point, and he didn't remember it anymore, but he did say that it could possibly have been from Canberra or Queensland because the colors on the plate looked like that. Now, a man named Colin Cole also needed to be contacted about his statement that he had made all of those years ago, the day after the disappearance. He had said that he was driving along Sydney Road in Bathurst when a dirty white car came out of the street speeding with its headlights off. Now, Colin had to brake so hard that he actually stalled his car and he watched this car turn towards Oberon, which was about an hour away from Bathurst. Now, the next day, between Bathurst and Oberon, a car was seen going towards a secluded bush track near a creek. Witnesses said nobody ever went down that area and so that's why they called the police. And so at this point, these new investigators, the new homicide squad decided to excavate this area believing that Jessica could have been dumped here. However, after two days of searching, they found nothing. Two days later on October 29th, four days since the disappearance, 
Investigators found that another statement had been made. A mother and daughter came forward to police saying that there had been an attempted abduction on her daughter. And this was on October 25th, the same day that Jessica and Vanessa were taken. Kayla O'Brien was only 11 years old when a man came up to her and tried to abduct her while she was at her father's. This was in Bathurst, so when the mom heard about Jessica's abduction in the same area, they realized it could be the same man. Another witness had tried to tell police that a former coworker in Bathurst had disposed of a White Holden Commodore when Jessica vanished, but nothing was done again. But all of that wasn't as nearly as bad as what was found next and then destroyed. You see, a year after the abduction, workers at the Gentleman State Forest in Oberon found an empty bottle of bleach, a possibly bloodied blanket, and a bloody pair of underwear that were women's. Now, this was in a very secluded area of the forest. The workers said that there weren't a lot of people who would go to that exact area unless they wanted intense privacy. Now, back then, investigators went to the forest they took the items, but they didn't really cordon off the crime scene. They didn't look for further evidence, and they only got one statement from one man. No one was even told about this lead that could have led to Jessica's body being found. And this new homicide squad tried to find more information on this years later and only found one statement from one of the workers. Now, as far as the evidence, well, it had been obtained, sat for about a year, examined, but not DNA tested, and then destroyed. During this inquest, the coroner, Sharon Frund, determined that Jessica Bessmall had died either on October 25th or shortly thereafter at the hands of a person unknown. Now, a reward of half a million dollars was offered for any information and was later up to one million dollars. But the coroner also said, in the days and weeks following Jessica's abduction, the investigators' assumptions and prejudices compromised the investigation, caused immeasurable additional distress and hurt to the family of Jessica, and may also have put other future lives at risk. The police department even admitted that they were deficient in a number of respects. And they also said this was probably based on the views of the investigators at that time. Now, Jessica's mother, Ricky, just wanted answers. She said that she's paralyzed by grief. And when she found out that she wasn't told about that evidence in the forest, she was so angry because she said she would have gone down there and started digging with her hands to try to find her daughter. She said that the treatment by police was abominable and that she really does hope that it was a quick ending for Jessica and that she wasn't held for days and tortured. She has since accepted that Jessica is deceased, but she keeps her name, her spirit alive, and she tells her grandchildren about their Auntie Jess and just how amazing she was. She says that she just wants Jessica brought home so she can bury her with dignity and get some closure, and she says that she just can't keep living like this, not knowing. Finally, Vanessa Conlon's trauma was validated. The man that she had warned them about was real, and now they had to accept that. Her best friend hadn't just run away, hadn't been a wild teen. She had something horrific happen to her and Vanessa had done all she could to save her. Vanessa has actually met with Faye Connors, the woman who allowed her inside her home and she told her, you know, without her, she probably wouldn't have survived. And, you know, she thanked her and Faye reminded her that from the very beginning, she believed her. She believed her story and knew that this poor girl had gone through something no 15 year old should, no one ever should. There was uh, not very many people here that believed me, so to know that Faye always has is just, I can't even put into words what that means. Now, these two men that investigators were honing in on were named at this inquest, and they were Andrew McBride and Craig Robertson. Now, both fit the general description of the man that Vanessa had seen, as well as the man that multiple witnesses had seen. And they were both also said to be interested in much younger women or teenage girls and had a history of violence towards women. Both also didn't have a clear alibi. However, one matched the description a bit more than the other and had left Bathurst for Sydney only hours after the abduction. This is 43-year-old Andrew McBride, who was their prime suspect. He had worked at the timber mill in Oberon the same time that Jessica had vanished and he had been questioned, but he said he actually didn't live in that area and he never visited 
Bathurst. And bank records did show that on that Friday before she was abducted, he was in Sydney. So he tried to say, I was in Sydney that whole weekend, but there was no evidence that he was there all weekend long. Now, Andrew was also said to have access to a Holden Commodore that had been located and it was shown that there were holes in the passenger floor. Investigators brought Andrew back in for questioning and they basically told him that they knew that he was keeping information when they spoke to him before, that they had found evidence that he had traveled to Bathurst many times that exact year she was abducted. Yet Andrew continued to say that he couldn't for the life of him recall ever being there, but then he said he may have been there once or twice, once for a court date where he had to go because he had assaulted a young man for giving him a bad check. He told police not to think that he was un being untruthful, but they found that he had been in Bathurst at this apartment he was renting and he left the day after the abduction, leaving town so quickly he didn't even give them back the keys. Investigators also said that they knew that he had been in a sexual relationship with a 15 year old girl before. Andrew said that he took his girlfriend and this 15 year old on holiday to get it together, but he knew that that was out of order and that his behavior was so far wrong. Andrew said that he would have never admitted this if police didn't already know because he was disgusted by himself. Now, the mother of this 15-year-old came forward saying that Andrew was about 37 at this time and they claimed to just be friends, but she had always felt this uneasiness when her daughter was around him, tried to keep her away from him, and that she knew Andrew had a thing for her. Now, Andrew was also known to give two different 15-year-olds marijuana and alcohol while he was dating one of their mothers. And then the moment that one of them turned 16, he sexually assaulted them. Now, Andrew continued to deny having anything to do with Jessica's abduction, even with his shady past. Now, the coroner did find that there was no evidence to link Andrew to this abduction and possible murder, but there wasn't any evidence to eliminate him either. This was mainly due to the lack of investigation that had been done so many years prior that possibly could have led them to a killer or at least to Jessica. Vanessa has said that after all of these years, she can look right at Andrew but she can't remember if that is the same man. Now, I, I've seen a lot of theories as to why this is, you know, saying, well, if I was abducted, I would remember my captor, but trauma can do a lot to your memory and it can, it can take away memories that even you would like to remember. So it's not necessarily her fault. It doesn't necessarily mean that Andrew isn't the guy just because she can't look at him and immediately be triggered or see him from that night, but it doesn't mean that it is the guy either. Now, a 60 Minutes reporter actually found Andrew eating lunch outside one day and asked him directly if he had abducted the girls. He ended up saying he knew nothing and that everything about the case he had just recently learned. He has still not been charged and Jessica has still not been found. It was found that this community had quite a large number of missing persons cases that the new homicide squad were having to go in, reopen, and try to solve. And it really worries me that if a young white female's case could be messed up and nothing was done due to the prejudice from the investigators, then how many people of color, the LGBTIA community, and many others were judged for who they were and so their cases were neglected as well? Was it simply prejudices that led these investigators to doing nothing or did they know who was doing this? Was it one of their own? Regardless of this, none of these investigators are being held legally responsible. Now, there was a theory early on in this case that there was a series of killers using the New South Wales highways and rural areas to kill. In 11 months, six different teenage girls and women had been murdered or abducted in the same area as Jessica. They had all also been thought to be hitchhikers. Now, one was Lee Stacy, who had been found dismembered. She was 16 year old who had vanished a month prior to Jessica in Broome's head, which was about nine hours away. And six weeks later, her body was found in a national park. An inquest was held for her too. A few suspects were named, but still today, her case is unsolved as well. It is now believed that she knew her killer. And one suspect is Anthony Charles Apps, who was a convicted sex offender who in 2003 was convicted of murder for shooting a man to death. 
Now, Lee's murder was also said to be poorly investigated. Now, another was 20-year-old Anika Margaret Hinckley, who had been hitchhiking a year prior to Lee's murder when she had been strangled. A woman came forward during her inquest to say that her ex-partner killed Anika. His name was Murray Cavanaugh, and he had allegedly confessed to her what he had done to Anika. But he then denied this to investigators and her case is still unsolved today. Then nine months after Jessica's disappearance, Lois Roberts was hitchhiking near Nimbin and found six months later in the state forest. This is also unsolved and many believe that Lee, Anika, and Lois were all connected, but Jessica was right in the middle of their timelines, so could she have been connected as well? Some say that the MOs are actually too different, the methods in which they were murdered, they are very much different. So they say that this couldn't be a serial killer, but it definitely did lead to a drastic decline in hitchhiking. And some believe that maybe one of the suspects that were named in some of these other girls' cases could be involved and could be Jessica's killer. Now, it does appear as though Jessica's life was taken that day, but in a way, so was Vanessa's. You know, not only did Vanessa go through this horrific experience of an abduction, she had been through even worse trauma because she survived because every single day she regrets getting in that car and feels survivor's guilt that Jessica didn't get away as well. On top of that, she was told for years she was lying about what happened. And that is almost the worst kind of pain to have your trauma invalidated and minimized and then not believed at all. Vanessa continued to fight for Jessica regardless, and I think that's the only reason we know a bit more about what could have happened to Jessica that day. Her determination to find her best friend, even though it meant reliving her own trauma, being told constantly that she was a liar, is so admirable. This little girl, 15 years old, she decided, regardless of what everybody else thought, she knew the truth and she was going to find answers. And for her, for Jessica, for Jessica's family, I truly hope that one day we do find the truth. And I think that it's still possible. I think that investigators did a really, really good job of trying to not have this solved, to, to try to minimize Jessica's life and death. But I think that if we can find Jessica's body and hopefully Hopefully there can be some sort of evidence on her that this can be solved. It is believed that whoever did this didn't live in Bathurst, but they might have lived in the Englandton area where Robert Fitzpatrick, the one witness who saw the car stop, lived because it was a very remote community. And to go through there on gravel roads, not knowing where you are, where you're going in the dark, didn't seem like something that someone would do unless they knew where they were at. However, this is not confirmed, so it could be someone who doesn't live there as well. It's believed that someone other than the killer knows what happened, and it's been 25 years now without answers. So if you know something, you better speak up. If you know the whereabouts of Jessica Small, please call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-333-000 or go to their website, which I will have linked down below. These girls deserved better and so did every single case that seemed to just be pushed to the wayside in this community and all around it. Why are there so many unsolved cases? What did the police know? Who exactly were on their teams? Who were they sitting next to and what were they covering up? What were they covering up in regards to letting their fellow investigators be prejudiced against these victims and use that as a reason why they didn't deserve to be found. All my love goes out to Vanessa and Jessica for their strength and Jessica's family. Don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.